is fintech, changing the DNA of the insurance industry. I welcome Mr. Parag Dhol to moderate this session. Parag is a managing director at Inventus India, a venture capital firm that invests in entrepreneurs building tech-focused companies in India. Parag started off with ICICI Venture, followed that up with stints at GE Equity and Intel Capital. He has a BTEC from IIT Delhi and an MBA from IIM Bangalore. You can follow him on Twitter at Parag Dhol. Over to you. Hi, I'm Srinivas Kunte. I'm the director for professional learning and advocacy at CFA Institute. I'm here today to give you a So it is, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Yashi Zdaiya. Uh, Yashi started off well, uh, he went to IIT Delhi. Uh, I went there as well, uh, but then took a strange, uh, strange move. We went to I'm Ahmedabad, uh, I went to I'm Bangalore. Uh, to, to make up for the deficiencies in his I'm Ahmedabad education, he did a second MBA from NCI. Uh, I didn't have to. Uh, as you can figure out uh, from that description, this is an unauthorized biography. Uh, but uh, but uh, to get serious, uh, I think Yashish uh, cut his uh, cut his teeth at eBookers, in my view, at eBookers, which was an online travel marketplace uh, in Europe, and then at first Europa, which is which was very close to what he is doing currently. He started off in 2018, uh, 2008, uh, as you probably know. He's he's an excellent sportsman. He's a, a he's a spectacular swimmer. Uh, he's an Iron Man, and as I like to think of him, he's a force of nature. Uh, it is it is very very difficult to compete uh, with the Yashish. Uh, so it should be a pleasure for all of us to listen to him talk about disrupting the uh, the insurance industry. Uh, so talking about the format for a moment before I hand it over to uh, Yashish. Uh, Yashish will uh, go through his comments in the first 20-25 minutes and then I get to ask him uh, a few questions for about 10-15 minutes, uh, post which we will take audience questions. So keep them flowing please, uh, keep the questions flowing as Yashish uh, uh, kind of goes through his talk. Uh, over to you Yashish. Thanks very much Parag for that very kind introduction. Uh, so I think in the first 15 minutes, 25 minutes, what I'll try to do is go through uh, Policy Bazaar, uh, why Policy Bazaar, what we were doing and the insurance industry and what we are trying to do there. So it would be wrong for me to say that in 2008, when we started, we had a very good idea of what we wanted to do. All we wanted to do at that stage was do some comparison, etc in insurance and attract customers and build a business. Uh, but by about 2009, about one year into the business, our ideas got crystallized quite strongly. And uh, here is what we found out, uh, which allowed us to build our business. There were roughly about uh, 3 million agents in the country, each one selling about one, one and a half policies a month on average, the better one selling maybe two, three policies a month. Even in 2008, for somebody to survive, you needed to make about 10,000 rupees per transaction. Given this is a financial product, that money had to be taken from the customer. And what that led to was largely a sales of a product called the investment product, where people would uh, have a ticket size of about, you know, 20, 25,000 rupees and roughly about 40% would be kept by the distribution. And that became the only viable product. Now, when we looked at the industry, we thought something else was required because I had uh, lost my uncle in 1983 and I had seen what difficulty he had gone through, his family had gone through uh, post his uh, you know, expiry. Uh, it was a young family. Auntie was about 26 years old. One child was about six months old. One child was about four, five years old. So I had seen that entire, you know, saga play out over 10 years from 1983 to 1993. And uh, I knew the pain a, a middle-class family in India goes through when 
uh, the primary economic uh, you know bread earner is no more uh, increasingly health costs were also going up in that time and you could imagine you know when we were when i was growing up uh, you know i'm almost touching 50 now i would go to a neighborhood hospital and it would cost me a few hundred rupees and i would be back you know with whatever little injection little a uh, correction but now the costs were very high uh, a visit to a hospital was a few thousand rupees a stay in a hospital was 20 25000 rupees per day a middle class person could not afford these costs and hence needed insurance however uh it was not being educated enough for what people were not buying even today when covid is happening only about 7 to 10% of people who reached hospital actually had an insurance policy so the rest of the people had to pay by themselves and that's that's quite a large expense for a middle class person to be you know taking that setback in an unplanned unplanned event right so we thought this was a very big need that needed to be addressed and then we said look at these 3 million agents why are they not selling these products and the first thing that struck us was that these products had a ticket size of roughly about you know at that time about 7 to 10000 rupees and the agent needed to make 10000 rupees per transaction so it could not happen now the second part that we realized very quickly was that and this is slightly controversial but i'll say it the way it is that when you sell a 25000 rupee per year product and take 10000 rupees by commission there is no way to sell that product except miss sell it you have to miscommunicate to the consumer and you will have various tricks to miscommunicate but you have to miscommunicate i i believe nobody once explained a product can actually buy it once you are told the surrender charges once you are told the various pieces uh, would not buy it so uh we felt there was a information asymmetry what is the information asymmetry the product information is not provided to the consumer also the consumer information thus because this community was trained at information asymmetry they would definitely not pass on the customer's information to the insurance company and insurance is far worse than lending from that perspective if you do not know your customer well enough if you do not know their lifestyle if you do not know about their bmi if you do not know about their um, you know uh, medical situation you could be taking on a risk that you just don't understand just to give you an example uh, and i will not belabor into which categories here but two very large categories of consumers roughly 50% each of the entire insurance industry one category has about three times the incidence and about 1.7 times the criticality so what that means is from a cost of insurance perspective one category costs about 5 to 6 times more than the other now if you're an insurance carrier you obviously want one you don't want the other right if especially you you would price for it but you'd probably price at 1 is to 2 but that's it nobody is allowed to price at 1 is to 5 or 1 is to 6 and these categories i'm mentioning are are 50% each actually let me tell you what these categories are it's anybody above 50 years anybody below 50 years that's that's what these categories are and you know all of you can verify this data this data is available right so then then how do you in that situation ensure right and how do you get the right information so we thought that digital was a great way to break this a information asymmetry you know i remember once a very large multinational organization came to us and said we want to hold a insurance savings day one of the top brands in the country you know mncs uh and i advised the managing director please don't do it because if you do it all you will do is expose the savings industry and if you expose it the sales will actually go down because the product per se is poor and they didn't understand it they held a savings day of course nothing sold like not even 10 policies probably some employees of that company might have bought those 10 policies because if you explain the product it won't sell and that is what transparency did so today if you look at the digital world what the customers started buying was term insurance health insurance they don't buy those investment products the investment products are probably 5% of our transactions and that to very low cost ulips or some some specific products but very very few of them right so it's almost a 
a, a total difference from the rest of the industry. Now, there was a second duty we had, which was to get the customer's information accurately to the consumer, uh, to, the, to the insurance company. Because if you don't do that, then the business becomes unviable. You know, the claims ratios in both, in the products we sell are, are very relevant, right? So if you, so let me just again, again, back off a bit. In the investment product, the total claim that you have to pay is probably 2% of the premium, perhaps. However, in the products we sell, health insurance, life insurance, the, you know, unless the claim is about 70%, why should the customers buy, right? It wouldn't make sense for customers. If, if the claims ratio was 2%, why would customers buy? So that 70% can go to 150% very easily and that would destroy companies. And it can also become 50% very easily with a little bit of diligence. So we, for the last 12 years, followed that diligence, kept collecting data, kept collecting various hundreds of uh, different parameters about customers and also started requesting companies for the claims data. So this claims data started coming back and we started correlating this over the last 12, 13 years, we've been correlating all of this. And today we have one of the most sophisticated, you know, pricing tools out there, which can at least price risk or understand risk. The third thing we started doing was capturing what the customer's needs were. So now you can think about it, right? If you're capturing customer's needs, if the customer's coming to you um, and you understand what product uh, they want to buy, plus you're able to capture the customer's risk through various mechanisms which doesn't, do not just include disclosure. Uh, by the way, just on disclosure, if you check with a reinsurer, you will find that digital has about a three to six times higher disclosure on voluntary questions than the uh, traditional channels. So clearly the disclosure was higher, but we went way beyond disclosure. And what did that lead to? So our health insurance book is now 13, 12, 12 and a half years old. Our claims ratio, at this point is about 30%. The industry that's 85%. You adjust for all growth, first year, last year, et cetera, et cetera, everything, you still find a 20% delta between traditional channels and us. Now, what does it allow you to do? Of course, that allows you to create better products for the consumers because your consumers are safer. And that's how the entire insurance industry works. So today you see products like a one crore cover at pretty much the price of a five lakh rupee cover with no catches whatsoever. And this trend will continue. So I think channel-based underwriting cannot go away because the insurance industry is essentially based on underwriting. And the data coming through the digital channel is way superior. And we obviously are focused on leveraging that to uh, you know keep building this out. Now, none of this was possible without one thing, which I haven't yet mentioned. The customer hadn't woken up to term insurance and health insurance. So if you went and checked on you know, search traffic, et cetera. There was almost no searches for what you would call pure life insurance, term insurance. Even the category was not there in 2008, 2009. You know, we, we have a valuation and all that stuff, but what people forget perhaps is over this last 12 years, we've probably spent about, you know, maybe 1000 to 1500 crore rupees educating the consumer about the need for health insurance and life insurance alongside the need for buying, uh, uh, on policy bazaar, comparing on policy bazaar. And that's a very large number, even for an industry as large as insurance. The insurance industry spends about 700 crores a year in communication, in consumer communication. And roughly about 150, 200 of that comes from policy bazaar. So all I'm saying is it's, it's, it's not been a free ride. It's It's been an expensive thing building that brand. But today we, of course, have a very strong brand which pulls in um, roughly, you know, 90% of anybody who wants to buy insurance digitally does come to us as their first port of call. And uh, that position has been achieved through, uh, you know, both that brand spend as well as the focus on the products, etc. Our focus going forward is going to be twofold. Uh, one is more consumer convenience, better customer service, uh, etc. And all those pieces falling into place. And I think the second part is going to be uh, a little more focused on product creation. So we uh, would work with companies and trying to create more and more products and with reinsurers and as much flexibility as the regulator provides, uh, you know, try to operate more and more in a managing general agent manner where we can help the customer with claims, help the customer with uh, various things. So as I see it, you know, back in 2009, 
and parag uh, and their team invested about 2010 11 so you know they would understand the statement our basic thesis has not changed much it is the same that story has not changed so there's been no pivots nothing it's just a very very simple straightforward story and the story if i recollect when we came to parag's office and explained it was pretty much the same but uh, i think uh, you know thankfully for us the story has played out uh, in the sense uh, each step of the story has played out every year and of course we can't do so if i was to look at the story it had probably 20 pages we are probably on page you know 10 to 13 uh, but we know what the remaining pages are and we want to play them out of course there's a lot changing in the country uh, with the uh, you know upi with the uh, ndhm now uh, so various pieces will keep changing i think government rails are coming and uh, we are uh, we believe as long as the consumer has uh, uh, as the consumer consent is taken and we utilize the government uh, uh, you know rails framework it's very positive uh, for uh, for a brand like ours uh, i think talking about the insurance industry at large and what percentage etc has shifted because this is a question that people ask all the time uh, i think for the relevant industry and i don't include savings in that i think savings will never be digital and i'll i'll tell you why the reason it cannot be digital is it cannot be sold digital i've already explained that right so i think it will never go digital uh, mutual funds and fixed deposits will go digital uh insurance saving sales will not go digital because the moment you go digital you'd rather go mutual fund and fixed deposits you won't buy the insurance product right however the insurance industry's strength will lie in term insurance and health insurance and disability and you know all those covers which are related to people i think assets will take time in india uh you know because people have to first cover themselves it's it's a very strange thing right most people have a car insurance but they don't insure themselves i ask people are you not going to be in the car when the car has an accident like you know you you got to be in it right and the amazing thing is the car is insured for 10 lakh rupees and they have a personal accident cover of 1 lakh rupees so <laughs> you, you get it right but but uh, so uh, i think uh, asset insurance can wait so all this home insurance mobile phone insurance you know all that stuff can wait but i think health and life is going to be a large chunk and the insurance industry will meaningfully make a large amount of its revenue and profitability from that industry through understanding of data and through utilization of government rails through setting up infrastructure which is going to be towards fraud detection see 2% of customers cause 20 30% of cost and whoever can control that 2% of customers the fraud i'm not talking about people who are unwell or anything i'm talking about fraudulent customers that 2% because in insurance the premium is typically 1 to 2% of the possible claim amount right so 2% of customers cause all the problem whichever company is better at identifying that 2% and making sure they don't deal with them will be better off but that's broadly what i had to say about policy bazaar you know i think it'd be much better if we uh, you know had had questions and you know i interacted that basis because otherwise become a monologue you don't want to only hear about policy bazaar yeah happy happy to uh, ask a few questions yes yes so uh, uh, yashish my my question was uh, that yes you are selling a different product uh, uh, you are a different channel your customers are better but there are vested interests isn't it uh, there are uh, there are insurance companies there's an established channel an agent channel and there is push back from there so uh, how does that work so there are two kinds of vested interest in the industry one is i for 25 years so one is strategic and you know one is tactical and i'll explain both so one is i am the ceo of this company i for the last 25 years have built my entire skill on setting up agency forces i can hire 83000 90000 agents in a month across the country deploy them set up branches do all that stuff train them that is my skill that's my strength so if anything comes which tends to question that model even though that model may have its flaws they say yeah we get it you know surrender charges are there and you know customer loses that's fine but this is what i have learned over the last 20 30 years fundamentally that's what they're thinking right um 
So why should I let it happen? And hence I will prevent it as much as I can. And it's a fair strategy, right? That's the, that's the tactical strategy. The second is, but, but you know, that can't last forever. At some point that, uh, you know, has to give way, whether, whether Policy Bazaar does it, Google does it, Facebook does it, whoever does it, the world is moving towards transparency. So you can't, you can't have an efficient channel, right? So yeah, they don't care about that. It is, I've got 10 more years to work as long as I can carry it through for 10 more years. You know, why do I care what happens after that? I'll be retired and I'll be fine. And the second part is more strategic. Uh, where some companies may believe that it is taking away the power because there is an industry where I, as a company have the ability to kind of explain a product to a consumer uh, or the consumer comes to me, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, and here is an intermediary coming in or a channel coming in, which sort of brings everything transparency to everything. And what that means is I have to compete. I was listening to the last panel and there was this conversation around, you know, decline of margins. And so the, for the basic mind, all it means is decline of margins. Transparency means decline of margins and longer term, that's not good. Uh, so they would have that. However, as I mentioned, as a basic level of thinking, if any company is smart, they would work with us to identify the pockets, which are profitable and, and, and win on those and work much more on the data alignment, et cetera, et cetera. We are not here to make anybody lose money. The companies that work with us actually do better. When they look at their channels, they think they're doing better. You know, think about it. You're a health insurance company. Would you rather sell at 85% claims ratio or let's say 30, forget 30, maybe 60, you know, worst case with everything included, or would you rather sell at 60, which is the more sustainable business. So we believe we are creating a fundamentally sustainable business for the industry. Second part, look, consumers, would come direct if you were one channel, if you were only one company. So in the world where there was one LIC or one something, consumers would only go to LIC, right? Or whatever. But when you have Tata, Bajaj, HDFC, ICICI, you know, you've got so many strong names plus SBI plus, uh, you know, uh, LIC, you've got Kotak, you've got Birla, you've got at least eight, 10 very strong names in the industry. Then why should the customer choose one over the other? And why would the customer not come and at least search, at least compare? So I think uh, to some extent, um, it is a different kind of, and then there's a the, the third type, the third type of, uh, you know, vested interest could be, I'm a large distributor offline. And I think, uh, you know, policy was entering my turf that again, I put in the first category because that is not a sustainable battle. Uh, I think uh, I, I focus my energies on the second conversation. Uh, profitable for you. We will give you volume. We will give you profitable volume. We will make you smart. We will give you more data. We will give you much more. And we will teach you how to be far more competitive and make more money. Rather than the other two, other two battles, which are more, you know, offline versus online battle, because that online is going to win anyway, whether it wins in five years or 10 years, it doesn't really matter. And whether Yashish wins or not, it doesn't really matter. Somebody's going to win it. It could be Parag, it could be somebody else. So uh, coming to the awareness point that you made, Yashish, and uh, it involves a lot of spend as you articulated, uh, particularly TV. And when I think back at, at some of these successful startups created in India, uh, you stand out uh, in terms of this, uh, how successful your TV campaigns uh, have been, uh, probably uh, probably one of your investors, uh, which is uh, which is Nokri is, is also in the same bucket. Uh, but how did you go about uh, uh, strategizing that in particular, given the, for example, we are seeing, I don't watch too much of IPL or I don't watch any IPL, but the, given the number of startups advertising on, on, let's say IPL, how did you go about, what is a successful way to create a brand through TV advertising? If I could ask you that question. See, um, Parag, honestly, we were not trying to create a brand. What we were trying to do, if you go through all the adverts from the very beginning till today, we were trying to communicate something better than that exists today to the customer. So if you look at the first one, it was, and, and it came through deep insight of what the customer was saying, what the customer was feeling. So all the creatives till date till very recently have been designed by me and we don't have an agency or anything. We just do it all ourselves. 
and we have a very small team that kind of focuses on this stuff it comes from deep inside of the consumer first one was ullu mat banu the entire the industry was 90% savings products which i have just said i am willing to challenge anybody into a one hour conversation on why anybody should buy any of those products and the customer was feeling it ki hame ullu banate hain so it was ullu mat banu you know and that that aligned with the consumer it resonated with the consumer the second was compare karo which again you know it's a very simple thing why would you not compare before you buy it makes it doesn't harm you don't have to buy you can just compare right then we realized we have to talk more about health insurance and life insurance so about you know at some point we started talking a lot about that and who can deny the need for health and we were very direct in our approach so we didn't mince words so for example when we you know we didn't say apni health achhi rakho apni sehat achhi rakho we didn't say all that we just said hospital jaoge lakhon ka bill aayega insurance le lo we said mar jaoge bachcho ki fees kaun dega we didn't say anything what, what if something goes wrong with you you know in in you know whatever right we didn't show any ice creams and all we just said a very clear message ki bhaiya kal ko nahi rahe so who's going to pay for your kids education who's going to pay for the school rental house rental because that's that's the problem i saw in 1983 because the kids actually moved to the village and then they came back to stay in the in our house for the next 6 years which was in merit so i i saw the reality was nobody helps anyone and i was stopped from taking out the advert which actually said a person dies and the whole group comes together and then everybody leaves and they say eventually you are left alone even your family leaves and that time the only person who can help you is insurance so it is very very stark dark messages to some extent but they are real and uh, you know we we we've gone down that now we've come to a stage where we are saying we need a broader message it is much more about hum aapki side hain which is because there's so many steps right the customer thinks that you know we may or may not be we have lots of issues sometimes you know refunds don't happen we have a one click refund it costs us money to do a one click refund but we do it now and we can't do it everywhere because it's also regulatory we have to take approval from the insurance company please understand i have to take insurance so when a customer pays money to the insurance company the insurance company may take 10 days to return it 20 days to return it whatever i have a process by which the customer can click a button and take the money immediately but for that i need the insurance company's approval i don't get it from everybody i've got it from few companies few i don't have it so i have all those issues right but what am i trying what am i trying to do i'm actually trying to fight the consumer's battle and there are 10 things i'm not getting right in this but most of it is because of various reasons right so we what are a simple line policy is on your side hai. and we got someone like akshay kumar to say that because that kind of covers a whole gamut of stuff uh you know uh but but yeah that's that's basically how we we saw it yeah akshay kumar is on the right side i must say but <laughs> we we'll let that pass <laughs> okay uh so yes i i do understand the uh, difference in messaging in terms of awareness versus brand building i just wanted to make a comment on something you said uh, you are about 10 page 10 or 13 on on page 20 jeff bezos says it is always day one so <laughs> maybe modify that with a message of yours uh but but seriously coming to some of the uh, some of the questions uh You, you did talk about one challenge. Uh, we did uh, parry on one challenge, which was the pushback from uh, from the insurers or uh, legacy channels. But what were the other challenges that you faced uh, while transforming the industry? Was the regulator a challenge? Building a team a challenge? Awareness? Wow. What is the biggest challenge in your view? See, both an enabler and I'll try to explain this in a little bit of detail. Uh, the regulator has built an architecture pre. comparison which is which basically encompasses a person going and selling insurance to somebody solicitation etc etc right so these it's it's largely covers those 3 million agents who go and sell insurance and that's what the regulatory architecture has been historically built for so suddenly when different ways of doing doing business start coming in and most of the regulators mind you so if you look at the regulator uh, you know there may be 100 employees or 80 employees at the irda roughly 75 80% of that maybe even 90% would come from the public sector undertakings who have only dealt in that manner there is only one way in which the public sector undertakings have dealt 
have agents agents go and sell even today they hardly have any broker business they hardly have any uh, you know bank assurance business they hardly have any digital business right that's that's the broad thesis right so they, they really struggle to understand any other way of doing it whether it is right or wrong you know if you've been trained in a particular way for 30 years suddenly changing the rules of the game uh, you know changing the architecture is very very difficult i once tried to explain to the regulator in a very you know nice uh, funny way i said sir again and again what you are trying to do is you've built a beautiful architecture and you're saying yashish this is my city tell me what's your address here you know a1 by 5 so and so avenue so and so not come to live in this city i have come to change your damn city and i don't want an address in your city and you are again and again through relation to give me an address in your city and i think that is the fundamental issue right so typically when we've had people coming from outside the industry they say yeah this is obvious but the regulator sometimes struggles with that to their credit still they have brought a, like to their credit we exist to their credit we have their license they created a new regulation for web aggregators three of them they spent 86 pages building the first regulation which is by the way the largest number of pages spent on any regulation in by the insurer by the by the irda so they really put their mind behind it to create whatever they could but it was the thinking was a fresh and i think that is what has to be um, you know and it's it's detailed and clearly they are worried about lots of things but uh, you know the inter- over time we have proven ourselves correct because our customers laps much lower see it's very easy when there's something wrong going on in the industry it's very easy to beat the benchmark right you can imagine right if the bsc had a lot of problems with it very easy to beat the beat the benchmark so it's very easy for us to beat the beat the benchmark so laps rates are much lower the miss selling rates are much lower the complaint rates are much lower even though we have far more educated consumers i tell them you know we're selling 20000 policies a day we probably get one two complaints a day like so you know uh But 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 even then, our size is growing. Please understand: one two complaints a day, sixty complaints a month, which will make us have the highest number of complaints with the IRDA. <laughs> okay. Because these are educated consumers, you know. If they don't get their policy for two days, they go and complain. It's not somebody sitting in Rampur who doesn't know whether real policy or not a real policy or what he's bought and you know what he's got. He doesn't even know IRDA. How does he complain? Right. There are a lot of questions flowing in Nishish, so I am uh, I am keen on getting as many answered as possible. So one of this is a slightly interesting and question. Uh, I mean, uh, somewhat controversial as well. Most of your campaigns are for Hindi-speaking customers. Uh, is it yes. because Hindi-speaking world contributes more to your revenue, or is it some other strategy? Harsh Kumar, we have uh, we have identified that our messaging has not been as strong in the south. and uh, if anybody is actually paying uh, uh, some uh, you know attention uh, recently we have started advertising in the southern languages uh, a little more than before so uh, for for all four actually for maharashtra uh, karnataka tamil nadu and uh, andhra pradesh and i know i did not include kerala there but uh, for these four uh democracy demographies we have started advertising however you know so far we haven't seen the results to be as positive as what we get on the hindi campaign uh you know i have debated with multilingual for the last uh, 10 years uh you know we've tried multilingual not even 2% of the traffic comes from multilingual So that's you know, strange, Ashish. Uh, it's, it's very, very strange. strange. No, you, you, you will, you will find it strange because if you go into different categories, you'll find different pieces. You know, the moment you go to money-paying people, people who have the ability to pay. See, who do I cater to? I cater to people who have at least got ten thousand rupees a month of income, minimum. If you, or at least one thousand rupees a month of disposable income towards insurance. No, understood. What I was trying number. to drive at by saying it is strange is that South is so much richer than the rest of the country, isn't it? That's just of course truth. it is. Of course it is. But Parag, you know, our website is in English, mm. and our messaging is Hindi. And my point is, most of the educated country. So, first of all, point absolutely taken. In the South, our penetration is way lower. 
and south is roughly 35 to 40 percent of the middle class in India, right? So the, the three states are three four states I mentioned are roughly about. So if I look at the 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 target segment I'm talking about, roughly 40 percent belongs here, right? So we've identified that gap. It's only about 23 percent of our sales. It should be 40 percent. So we have a we have a north bias. Uh, so we are we are trying to address that, but economically, running language adverts is not seeming to work in that direction. English adverts totally does not work because English adverts, you know, so we, we are struggling with using mainstream media for local languages. We're really struggling. If somebody is an expert at this, we'd love to, you know, get some expert advice on this, but we are, we are struggling on that and it's working at roughly three times the cost. So the, so the, so the cost to revenue ratio is about three X and, and you know me, as long as it's three X, we won't move. If it's 1.5 X, we'll start moving. Okay. okay. So coming to competition now, uh, Mayank asked, Mayank Kriplani asks a question. Do you think competition from Paytm, PhonePay, Amazon with a big customer base and potentially low CAC uh, will be a disruptor to a policy bazaar? See, my point is, yeah, why not? You know, um, could be, uh, but you know, I, I've been hearing this for years. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe, yeah, why not? But I haven't seen that level of focus on health insurance, life insurance, et cetera, yet from those, I see a lot of attachment product focus. So, you know, I see, if you look at the sales that happen, it is mostly mobile phone insurance or, uh, uh you know, some very low ticket insurance. See, um, once Leaf Excel mentioned this to me because I used to be, I've always been paranoid Parag, as you know. Lee said, what you've built isn't easy to replicate. He's no longer with Tiger, but he, he told me that, Yashish, don't be over worried. What you've built, it's not that straightforward. If it was that straightforward, yeah, people would do it. Which so, piece of Yashish, which piece of it is particularly not straightforward? There are thousands here. Okay. See, please understand 85% of my revenue, revenue uh, still comes from my call center. People don't buy insurance. They still have to be convinced. There are still 90 minute conversations happening. So yes, the tech gets the customer there. It can bring the horse to the water, but it can't get the horse to drink. It's not like buying a pair of shoes. I, I adore a pair. Of, remember, this is a product where the best case scenario for you is you never use the product. You get it. My point is, uh, See, I don't want to make a dramatic statement and encourage customer competition to come and compete with me. That'd be stupid. Why should I invite everybody? My point is, it's difficult. You know, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Uh, on a some, somewhat related note, Mega Malpani asks, uh, the hidden literature, especially for uh, health insurance can be very confusing when done in a digital way and there is no one size fits all. So how, how does one uh, comprehend this data digitally uh, without human intervention? You did so I'm very happy to have this conversation with Mega in person. Mm -hmm. I made this statement to a person in a party about 10 years ago. I challenge what you will get in half an hour from Policy Bazaar. I challenge any other mechanism that you get that much information in four hours, right? The level of detail, the level of information, comparative analysis, that's it. It's that simple. And you know, it's obviously I can't elaborate fully on this, but you know, should that be an offline conversation? Very happy to have it, you know, basis, basis data. Typically what happens in a health insurance policy? People don't even know what they've bought. One agent comes and sells them one company's product. Typically that's what happens, right? They, they don't know much about that product. So, so how, how, how does it work? I mean, 90 minute calls. I, I thought people do less research to buy a 50,000 rupee phone. So, so what do they talk about? A phone is a desirable product, Parag. The moment I get it, I start enjoying it. What are you going to enjoy in a health insurance policy, man? <laughs> okay. You're going to get nothing out of it. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. As I said, your best case is you never use it. You just keep paying, right? 
the worst case is you know the wor- the bad case is you need to use it and the insurance company pays for it the worst case is you need to use it and the insurance company still doesn't pay for it <laughs> right and that uh, is bad mm. yeah but but the, but the but the reality is somewhere out there so i think um, this industry works backwards and many a times we have seen things pick up very fast uh, but totally blow over so i think i think it's an intricate uh, you know i I'll, i'll make one more statement when i started first europa and you mentioned that briefly we failed in first europa and i was as hard working i was as diligent i was everything and i went back to this guy david stevens who's the ceo of admiral because the story for policy bazaar actually starts with me having a job at admiral and i went back to him and i said sir why do you think i failed and he said it's a very intricate industry and i remember those words totally it's a very very intricate industry it's almost impossible to understand from the outside uh so it's very nuanced so you know when uh, yeah so i think uh, people will realize the difficulty once they get into it now i have a theory based on the investing experience i, I think somebody coming into uh, coming from the outside in a fossilized industry and insurance would probably uh, classify at least in india as that uh, can, can uh, well but as long as the it is not very uh, uh, high on domain and i think insurance is very high on domain we saw funny at at red bus succeed spectacularly yeah. by coming in from the outside but i uh, i take a point that it is not always possible in high domain uh, knowledge industries high context specific markets like like let us say insurance um, so uh, nitin krishnan had asked a question agency force is still the primary channel for sourcing retail policies and premiums for both general and uh, life insurance companies in india how do you see that channel being replaced by new age technologies in the near future so if you look at the data if you leave out lic agency is no longer the predominant force uh, lic obviously is the largest company and they deal only in agency like 95 99% 97% of their sales is lic as uh, agency so that is why agency stays a very uh, dominant force in the life insurance side but otherwise you know it isn't even on term insurance etc it is um, okay so i'll make a statement i think uh, term insurance health insurance cannot be sold by agency just cannot and i'm making that statement with a deep thought which will play out over years the quality of business will be so bad the claims ratio will be so bad. there is no way uh, that good quality business will come through that so it will it will all you know uh, twist and turns will happen all the kinds of activities will happen that is only safe for uh, savings business for the for the industry and it's only safe uh, for maybe motor because motor you can't really predict right that you want to have an accident etc but in health You, the information you have and the information the company has can be different and you know the information you have can have a big impact on your claims ratios uh people right about one third of our company of our country at a particular age has some chronic disease or the other if you have a chronic disease you're going to have an expense pretty much every year uh whatever happens right so i think uh, if you could fudge the disclosure of that a little bit uh, so my point is yeah agency i think will really really struggle in risk products uh from not a cost of distribution perspective but from a now uh from a claims perspective second part digital is being massively mis underestimated and i'll explain why some people have said that you know it is about 3 5% of insurance let's get to the health insurance industry the health inter- insurance industry the retail market is roughly about 25000 crores the fresh retail market the fresh retail book is you know you can do the math but it will come to about 6000 crores that's the entire fresh retail book of this country a billion dollars right not even a billion dollars 800 million dollars sorry the dollars been rising <laughs> 800 million dollars is the entire fresh retail health insurance book of this country how much is digital well i can tell you it's at least 1000 crores if more is digital so digital is already 15% of the health insurance industry how much was it just 6 years ago 1% Okay. So it's gone from one to fifteen percent in six years. Where is it going to be in five years? There is no way agency can compete with digital on health insurance or term insurance. Motor, anyway, is not with the agency. It's, it's with Maruti insurance brokers or whatever. Right? Not just Maruti, but Maruti, Hyundai, etc. The auto, auto majors have it. So I think agency is 
in a difficult spot from many perspectives and uh, it is somehow being uh, you know sustained because of the uh, of the large uh, you know psu structure however agency can come back into into the game and it can be very very powerful and i can explain to you why it's exactly how uber enabled drivers if you could have a policy bazaar so what are we not allowed to do today we're not allowed to deal with agents we're not allowed to deal with physical people but if we were i would give my platform to all agents i don't have to do the selling that i do in my call center they can do it the customers can come to me and what i can put in place is a rating infrastructure where the customers rate those cust- the, the the and i can have a check back i can have a check back so you know i'm the agent i've gone to the customer i'm saying five things to him i can have a call back where parag is sitting in the in the on the policy bazaar side clarifying not doing any sales just clarifying this is right this is wrong and thus rating agents in terms of miss selling etc that infrastructure would work beautifully and our 3 million agents will survive and they will do a better job than digital because i know they can make more revenue per enquiry than i can ever do so how but have government other has to countries, authorize it sorry as uh, how have other countries like let's say europe uh, particularly europe i am interested in uh, solved this problem of uh, term insurance and and health insurance having low uh, low ticket sizes versus let's say investment products see europe doesn't need anything if if my uncle in 1983 was in europe what would have happened his kids would okay. still be going to the same school okay. fair his uh, uh, family would still be having his house okay you know i have a guy on rent he stop paying rent he said i'll get your house anyway you will have to you will get paid by the council so okay. all i'm saying is the social security network is has reached a stage where these products are not required in the west this is the social infrastructure that can be created for the middle class in india and vishesh basuja uh, had a very pithy question but i think uh, he wanted he said thoughts on universal healthcare and how how that impacts your particular uh, uh, your particular <laughs> segment sbu or whatever no no so if if universal healthcare came in our business would diminish but what a fantastic thing for the country we would welcome it see it's not about just us right this can't be about us we we are too small to in this whole scheme of you know grand scheme of you know getting india the middle class to feel secure about going about their work having health insurance having life insurance we are too small in that story but i believe uh, now answering the question in a slightly different way i believe universal healthcare will not come in india for two specific reasons the what was the beast for that the middle class felt during covid it was not the fear of getting covid it was the fear of going into a government quarantine right at least in the north i don't know about the south but in the north the, the biggest fear was going into a government quarantine and people didn't want that right so i don't think people want to go to a the middle class does not aspire towards government service i think the middle class does not want, wants to go to medan wants to go to fortis wants to go to apollo hospitals and you can't provide that level of healthcare at government cost you just can't so i think that is where the breakdown is your the healthcare costs are too high uh, so otherwise i think the entire healthcare industry will become nationalized uh, in which case yeah that's that's a fantastic thing if that could happen but uh, then you know we also know the problems with that so uh, puja hopefully we have time for one or two questions so kazi as usual asks uh, a lighter question uh, so both of you are fitness freaks enjoying your marathons and more not me it is you yashish uh, to what extent does the focus determination and stamina from that domain translate to success in corporate life that's a good question and this is a very important question kazi you ask because um, i think we all have 60 year careers you know we start at about 20 25 and we work till we are about 80 85 you know we may think we've retired but actually we don't retire right we keep working and i think many careers bloom after 40 and the reason they bloom is those people are physically able to go about their work and thus physical fitness is very important second part it's a massive massive stress buster right you imagine our situation where you have a regulator and you know various things going on and you know every day 
Sarabir Singh has just joined as our CEO and I was telling him, look boss, in 360 days, we will have 30 days where we think we are dead. We will have 180 days where we think we are the top of the world. And we have 150 normal days, so, you know, the, the kind of, and yes, all I can see is every year, the better days are uh, more and the worst days are fewer, but the days still come. And I think, um, uh, you, you get through those days much better, uh, if you've got energy and if you've kind of got a bit of stress relief coming from these sides, but you know, honestly, I don't do it for that. Yeah. I just do it because I enjoy it. You know, I've been doing it since I was eight years old. So, you know, it's a byproduct, but it helps, you know, it helps a lot of people tell me I have a lot of energy. I can see people in the look, people in the eye, speak straight. Um, you know, that's, that's all good. Yeah. You can speak straight for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pooja, this is the last question. Uh, Pooja herself asked it. What about insurance provided to corporates by, uh, uh, by corporates to employees? People stick with that by default. Uh, what are your So thoughts? that's a good option, but see most corporates historically, uh, used to provide the minimum possible cover. Uh, required to get by. So typically, so I'll tell you, the, I'll tell you the fundamental problem with insurance in India, in health insurance. Sorry, it's going to take just one minute. What we are saying is a middle class person is telling the, the insurance company that dear insurance company, cover me to three lakhs. If the claim is one crore, I'm rich enough. I'll handle the 70, 97 lakhs, which is obviously not true. What the middle class customer has to say is dear insurance company, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm good enough to handle the first one lakh rupees. Beyond that, I don't have ability. Please handle everything else. That's how it's got to work. It's it's basic, right? It's basic, right? There's nothing, nothing. Who has more ability to handle it? Insurance company or the customer, right? And I think that's the problem with all corporate covers. They have a limit. And I'll, I'll say a very dark thing. You know, my first company I worked for, the CEO said, when we have a health emergency, everything is opened. And we support in every possible way, our employee. I'll say a very dark thing. Usually lasts about six months to 18 months. After that, I have not seen a corporate actually support the employee. So, and I, and I saw it in that company's case also. One guy had cancer first, second, they supported. Second time they said, yeah, sack him, yeah. no work, you know, no revenue coming. What's the idea? Right? So you have to take care of yourself. So yeah. And unlimited cover is the only way to go. So do we have time for one more or okay. okay, maybe, maybe I'll go ahead and ask one more. Uh, so, uh, this is about tokens, etc. Shimul Sengupta asks in a futuristic scenario, do you see tokenization of risk products, disintermediating the large balance sheet of underwriters? I don't understand what tokenization means, but maybe if you could elaborate a bit, but uh, are you talking about uh, some kind of bite size insurance or. Um, no, I, I don't know. Is this it, probably, I don't understand it. I'm sorry. This would probably be something related to blockchain, etc. And I, I have no clue either. So, so I think blockchain <laughs> is coming into insurance. Blockchain is definitely coming into insurance. What it will do is use multiple data formats to, uh, so what, what's happening is with NDHM, the entire claim process is becoming an e-claims process, uh, where your policy is digitized. Your uh, uh, bill is digitized, hospital bill is digitized, and the claims process between the hospital and the insurance company is digitized. So you have auto adjudication, bases, data fields, and you don't need human intervention. That is happening. I think uh, looking out between you know 18 months to three years, you will have a lot of that, which will give the consumer confidence in the insurance industry. Uh, and, you know, uh, have the confidence that the claim will be paid according to the rules, not because of the whims and fancies of a company, right? But other than that, I don't know uh, what this implies. Maybe maybe it is something, you know, we could discuss offline if anybody wants to reach out and I could try and understand a bit more. So, Shemul, I would suggest to reach out uh, offline in that case. So with that, I think we uh, uh, we can we should probably stop here because we we are kind of uh, overshooting uh, at this point in time. Thanks, Yashish, uh, for taking the time to kind. Thank of you very much, Parag, and thank you very much to the CFA Society for having us here. Society, thanks, thanks thank for you. inviting us as well. Bye.